The following is a presentation of the Healthcare Facilities Network. Hello, I am uh, pleased to introduce my guests for our Masterminds of Compliance group. And this is a group that um, you will see people come and people go, has schedules allow, but I appreciate our two core members so far, although that may change as we go forward, again, based on schedules. But I'm going to ask my two guests to kindly introduce themselves, introduce their role, what they do, where they do it. And then, since this is a compliance mastermind, why do you enjoy compliance? So if we could do those three things, I would appreciate it. I sound like a, uh, a teacher, which I am not. So anyways, Taylor, can we begin with you first, please? Sure. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Taylor Vaughn. I am in Dallas, Texas. I work at Children's Health. Um, I'm a system-wide uh, facility manager over regulatory compliance. Uh, so I oversee everything from engineering to security to EVS, um, everything compliance related. I also work uh, part-time with Legacy FM and I uh, help create um, training content, um, everything from equipment, troubleshooting, compliance to soft skills. Um, and I love compliance because I like being tested. Oh. Um, I think it's really great to, you know, do everything we're supposed to have everything, you know, good and, and have joint commission or whoever come in and, you know, see all the great work we're doing and tell us that we're doing the right thing, that we're making our hospital safer. Um, I like knowing what the standard is that I have to do. I, I like knowing all the codes and what, you know, what what we can do to, to play our part in, in making our environment safer. So that's that's why I enjoy it. Thank you. I, you know, I see that I love compliance as like a bumper sticker on the back of the car. I love compliance. This is Taylor's um, second time on the network. We recorded a couple of months ago now with with Clayton Smith about team building. And I would encourage you, I'm not going to ask Taylor to recount her story now, but talking about <laughs> intros into healthcare facilities management, if you find that episode with Taylor and Clayton Smith, Taylor will tell how she got roped into healthcare facilities management and <laughs> And the role she's, it's very unique and it, it is very, very different. Taylor, thank you. Jack. Yes, uh, thanks for having me, Peter. Uh, so I, I can't say I was roped in, I went willingly. <laughs> but uh, my foray into compliance started at Detroit Medical Center. Um, and from, I started in facilities management, which is always a great place to start and work my way up through a few layers to become regional leader over compliance for that eight hospital system, uh, also owned by Tenant Health. So some of you, especially Vaughn, might recognize Tenant Health in her market. But, um, and from there, I went to uh, MedExcel, which is a, a subsidiary of Ascension Health. And I had 140 hospital system where I managed regulatory compliance from a life safety environmental care perspective. And I had a group of people that we did mock surveys throughout um, all of the, those 140 properties and a lot of employer surgical centers and so forth. From um, there, recently I moved to the Joint Commission uh, where I'm a life safety code surveyor. Um, but why I enjoy it, I guess my first exposure as a new facility manager was, I just came from facilities management in, at a university and I walk into my office first day and I'm like, what are all these binders on the, on the shelf? <laughs> so I'm like, man, I got to come up to speed on this stuff. So it was probably more about, I didn't feel comfortable not understanding. Hmm. So once I dug in and started trying to understand what all these binders are, and what all the testing inspection was, I didn't have that. It, it was at a major university, but healthcare is a whole new world for regulation. Um, so it was basically my trying to grasp that. And I think I had a knack for it. So, you know, sometimes when you're good at something, you enjoy doing it more. So that kind of was my my role in it. And wherever there was an opportunity from that point on where I could make things better in terms of process, I kind of gravitated towards that. So, so that's kind of how I began in. Taylor, I would imagine you coming from outside of healthcare into healthcare might have, did you experience something similarly to that? Absolutely. And um, I find that, you know, 
knowing why we have to do all these things helps, especially our technicians. Like, you know, why do I have to go test this operating room every day for, for ventilation? Well, if we explain it to them and tell them, you know, it's not just because the code tells us we have to, it's here are these reasons how it's going to help protect our patients. I think knowing the why behind it mm. helps a lot and really, really made me want to dig into it deeper. So do you two, do you guys think, and, and you know, I think one of the, um, I think one of the underrated attributes of a good manager, good director is, is being inquisitive, kind of always asking questions and always wanting just to learn more, whatever it is. I mean, inquisitiveness can go a number of different ways. Do you feel that that is essential though to a, a to a compliance type role? I absolutely do. Um, and I try to anticipate, you know, if I'm sitting in front of the joint commission, what they're going to ask me. So when my technicians bring me something or, you know, bring me testing with a failure, I, I ask those same <laughs> questions, you know, how long was it down? What did we do to fix it? Where's your work order? When are we going to re retest it? Um, and, you know, sometimes they get annoyed with me, but that's okay. Um, these are, these are things we have to know and we have to ask. This is Peter Martin. If you or your organization is interested in advertising or partnering with the Healthcare Facilities Network, including sponsoring content, then please email me using the barcode in the lower right of your screen. From the trades level to the vice president level, from planning, design, construction, project management, compliance, safety, and security, the Healthcare Facilities Network reaches FM people where FM people uh, you are. You know, and I would add to that, you know, you're not going to last long in facilities management uh, or compliance. It's so sophisticated today. If you don't have an inquisitive mind, if you don't want to learn and grow, um, the one thing is, as inundated as you may be in your role, you will learn something just about every day new. And if you don't embrace that, uh, I can't imagine what your life is going to be like if you don't, because if you don't get out in front of that and try to learn and try to continue to expand your your acumen around this business, it'll probably eat you. <laughs> probably eat you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to get into the topic. But Jack, I want to ask you a question. And if you don't want to answer it, you certainly don't have to. Um, but is it is is there a mind? How is it now, like mindset change for you now being with the Joint Commission, whereas before you were on the client side? Is that is what's that feel like? Well, uh, you know, it, it, and I'll say right now that I, I'm not speaking today for the Joint Commission. So sure. doing this voluntarily, privately, but um, I do have some perspective around that. Uh, it, it's not, I got to say, it's not a whole big change because I came from my last five years prior to joint commission. Mm -hmm. I was doing mock surveys and I was doing the best I could to mock the exact mm -hmm. process of the joint commission. So we looked at all their stats, looked at all their data. Every week I would review two or three surveys and the results and look at all the findings. So when you come sitting across the table on the other side, yes, I have to learn all the process for the Joint Commission and the way they do things, things that you may not see from behind the scenes. But really, the core body of work is not that different than doing a thorough mock survey in your own hospitals. Hmm. It wasn't, it's not that big of a transition for me. I wanted to, so as I said, we're, this is going to be um, multi episodes, and, and today we want to start with pre work getting ready for a survey for compliance, getting your arms around it. You two both alluded to it. You walk into this office and you have all these binders. Where do you start? And the reason we're doing this, and and Jack, you would reach out to me about it, is we are seeing just across the industry, across the discipline, more and more folks from outside of healthcare right. are coming into these leadership roles. And, and what is your biggest risk? Well, your biggest risk is compliance. And that that's kind of the genesis behind this discussion. So we really want to start kind of, we're calling it episode one, pre-work. But also what's happened, and you both know this because, you know, you work in the field. And we just did a, um, you know, here at Gosselin Martin, we just conducted our, our annual survey. One of the comments that came across, and I'd like you guys to, to comment on it, if you will, was that folks were saying they're just feeling increasingly not even over but just the burdens relative to compliance with everything else on their plate is becoming 
overwhelming. And it, and and those were comments that you know I compared them to, and that's why I like to do them yearly. We hadn't had as many comments as that in the past. So I was wondering from your perspective, compliance as a whole, is it, it kind of what's this, is it becoming not burdensome, but is it becoming overwhelming? Is it, um, it absolutely is a lot. I, w- Children's Health is in a unique position because not every hospital has a facilities compliance person. I, we actually have an entire team that does that. Um, but most places don't. It's the facility manager, it's the facility director who has to worry about all this documentation on top of all their other responsibilities. And sometimes it gets it gets pushed to the back because there's literal fires and floods that they have to deal with. Um, so if you have the opportunity to ha- hire a compliance person that specifically does documentation and rounding and helps with your work order system and things like that, that will help you. I know not everyone has the means to do that. Um, but I actually, I spoke about this at our, our Texas conference um, the last year is compliance is an investment. Mm-hmm. And if you don't invest in it, it will cost you more later. So if you're not out rounding, fixing things, doing the inspections you're supposed to, you may get fined. You're going to get findings from the joint commission. You're going to have to pay your contractors to come in and do it within the 60 days or or whatever it is that joint commission requires. So it's going to cost you money up front, but if you don't do it, it's going to cost you more down the road. Kind of like your infrastructure. Exactly. Peter, what I would add to that was, you know, when you first asked that question, I looked at what's changed in the last five years and Mm -hmm. and I was thinking to myself, well, not really that much. I mean, in fact, joint commission is, reduce some elements of performance. But then I think about what happened five years ago when CMS put out a letter saying, uh, we have this Legionella thing where we've got an increase of, uh, I forget what it was, 86. It was a large number over a few years of uh, patients that contract the Legionella. And so they put out this letter and also we're doing a lot of water management and testing, inspecting, and now we're looking at pH, uh, and residual chemicals in our water and such. So yeah, there's some things that change here and there over time. Um, and then um, the same year, 2017, we started amping up looking at door inspections, right? And joint commit, or excuse me, CMS started saying, the first letter said, we're gonna look at smoke and fire doors. But eight months later, they dropped off smoke doors. Still a requirement, however, if you look at NFPA, but these were always requirements, even after CMS put out that letter and everyone started doing fire door inspections throughout their facility. They were requirements before that. So I can't say the burden increases so much over the time. I think I'm going to go back to what Vaughn had said, or Taylor, I'm sorry, Taylor, Taylor said, and she said, it's about resources and resource allocation. If you are and there's a lot of facilities, folks, that are doing more with less because they may not, they're challenged on maintaining positions um, within their house. If you're not getting the same resources you did five years ago, it's going to feel like regulatory compliance has become a much greater burden. And really what has changed is not compliance burden, but your resources. If you do not have adequate resources to manage regulatory compliance, you will feel like you're always battling and you will be battling. I mean, you won't have the time and attention to detail that you need for compliance, which is, you know, that it's very important that you have some dedicated folks to that. Has, um, Taylor, you had mentioned, you know, documentation and just talking about kind of these increased burdens. Has, as um, electronics, has, has document electronic documentation, the advent, not the advent, it's been there, but <laughs> the introduction of more technologies, has that assisted or has it been a hindrance? Because I hear both. You know, there are some folks like all this technology, but it's not helping me. And there are others say, got this technology and it is helping me. What are your perspectives on technology and its its benefits and or detract detractions? So we were uh, forced to switch to electronic documentation. We had a, a survey at the height of COVID um, mm-hmm. and the Joint Commission said, you have to send us all of your documentation electronically before your survey. Mm-hmm. Um, so we just made the switch and got rid of all my precious clean white binders. How much and, work was um, Taylor to 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 take all? It of- was a lot. 
yeah, it was a lot at the beginning, but once you get set up, um, it's, it's so much easier to manage. I'm not constantly printing things and punching holes and, <laughs> um, creating new binders every December. It's so much easier. It's a lot of work at the beginning, but once you get set up, um, you know, we had our joint commission surveyor last October and the week before I was able to, to, you know, be at home and go through all my documentation rather than spending, hmm. you know, 16 hours a day at the office going through all my binders. So that, you know, from that perspective, it helps. Um, it was a, it was a hard transition to get the technicians to email me things rather than handing me a, a piece of dirty paper, yeah. um, which I, I like the dirty paper because then it shows they actually did it. But <laughs> that was a hard transition, but you know, we're, we're three years in and, and they know that this is how we're going to do things where we have PDFs and we're going to email our documentation. We don't have binders when we rarely print things anymore. They don't print their work orders, um, which a lot of them were very used to, but yeah. you know, once you get over that initial setup, it's so much better. So that what, what's the technology that they, they use out in the field? So they have um, iPads, which have their work order system on them, and they can complete their work order right there on the, the iPad. And, um, you know, I just go in and pull the documentation I need from our work order system. And just last thing relative to, and as, as since it's been implemented, either completion rates or is pencil whipping eliminated, completion rates better, what have you, you know, what are the results you've seen from that? That's a, a tough question. Um, pencil whipping is always a risk. Um, so I'm not yeah. going to say that that has gotten any better or worse, but it has absolutely increased productivity because they're not going, you know, printing the work order and then going to the site and then coming back to get their tools and then going back to the site and then coming back to the shop to sit down at the computer and, you know, do their work. They're doing it all right there. Um, so, you know, decrease in time needed, decrease in steps across the hospital. So absolutely has increased productivity. Jack. You know, I would say that everybody is probably running a hybrid system at the very minimal. Even when you don't think you've got an electronic system, just about everybody has a computer-based model for, for ma managing their PMs and their in-house work. And there's usually elements that stretch into even what you may have your vendors do. Um, so certainly there are some people that have gone strictly to or entirely to electronic, and that's quite a bridge to make. But a lot of people still don't feel comfortable not having a, a paper process as well. Uh, and for some good reason, because if you don't really have a super good system and a good way to, a good process for monitoring it, you're going to always be wondering if you got everything where it needs to be. Um, a lot of that is about good process. Like all, everything with compliance is about good process management. So, um, you know, it, it's a, still a mix out there, I think, largely. And um, you see a lot done electronically, but it's not quite the same. And it's also about, I don't think we're going to get to this, Peter, at some point. We'll talk about vendor management. Uh, mm -hmm. We have every, every facility has a number of vendors come in and do certain portions of the regulatory required testing and inspecting. And we'll get into talk a little bit about executive summaries and things that make you feel comfortable as a manager that you can see without going through maybe a 300 page report. You can see your vulnerabilities from an executive level without reviewing every detail of every report. I don't have to put my hands on every page um, if, if it's done right. So we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that and talk a little bit more in depth about that. Hmm. How would you assess, um, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about process management because we both have, have alluded to that. And, you know, if, if there's somebody who's new to healthcare facilities management and suddenly they have compliance dropped, you know, what are the, what are the beginning things they, they should be looking at? Let's assume that there's not a, a mentor there for them, or even if there's a mentor there for them, that mentor is stretch it a thousand different ways. But before we get to that, just a last question on this. And and Taylor, you know, I know you're part of a, a, a system, a large system. And Jack, you were with MedXL and now with the Joint Commission. So 
How would you assess, and I'll start with you first, Jack, if you don't mind, how would you assess the level of knowledge, understanding that exists out in the field at the individual hospitals across America? So I'm asking you to speak a little bit, might be beyond you know, what your purview is, but what's the knowledge level out there in facilities management relative to compliance, the joint commission, what's the experience, what's the knowledge, and has it changed? Well, you know, we got some really good people out there, um, well-tenured people, been in the business for many, many years, and that's a plus and a minus because we have a lot of people near retirement age, mm -hmm. and I think over even over the last five years, we've seen a lot of people vacate their roles and leave a void behind, and I think that's a particular challenge more so today than what we experienced five years ago. And just looking at the uh, the trends, I think we're going to see more of that in the next five to 10 years where we see tenured people leaving their positions. And I see today when I walk in hospitals, more and more instances of folks in a facilities leadership position that have little or no healthcare background. Um, I'll talk to somebody, they may have been there six months, but where they came from was a total different industry. As healthcare is so highly regulated, you have to build an acumen over time, certainly around regulatory compliance. I'll tell you a quick story. So my first job in facilities management, again, I told you, I sat down, what are all these white binders in front of me? I got 30 binders. I got NFPA manuals all over the place. And I started to feel comfortable after a couple of months of digging in. I see I've got everything ranged by EPs. I didn't do it. The system was already there. But I'm starting to understand it. Then a fire marshal walks in, and all of a sudden, I, I'm getting used to this language of joint commission, elements of performance, EP1, supervisory devices, and whatever. And I, so I kind of knew my way around at a superficial level. But all of a sudden, this guy's not talking about elements of performance and EPs. He's talking about NFPA. And I'm like, so we're talking a little bit different language. And that's when I recognize, okay, you might you might start to get something, but it's deeper than that. Yeah. You can start to get something at a superficial level, but you will, can, you will continue to get bombarded with a lack of knowledge in other areas. It's not easy for, any, for a person coming into healthcare. If you are charged with responsibilities around regulatory compliance, it will take time. There is a learning curve. And when I see some of these young folks, and maybe not even so young, they're just coming from a different industry. Yeah, I feel for them because there's a lack of knowledge there that you're going to have to come to speak with, and some of that is just gained over time and experience. I know and, that you've got a good training program around you with a larger system. God bless you if you do. <laughs> I know that you said you um you you came into healthcare from education. You were working at a at a university. From your perspective, um, are there Industries, maybe pharmaceuticals, maybe nuclear power, power plants. Are there industries that make a little bit of an easier transition into hospitals and healthcare based on regulatory com compliance requirements? That's a that's a great question because now you're talking about transferable skills. Yeah, there are there are a lot of areas where you can get transferable skills. You can be a bright person to start off with. That helps a whole lot, uh, and you, maybe a quick study that that's going to help you a lot. But, you know, we see people, I've seen a lot of people in facilities that come from the engineering world, uh, that come from the military, frankly, and, and some of those folks are very well prepared because it's a regimented system. Mm -hmm. and, well, you can learn a lot. I've known some people that worked on ships and the Navy, and yeah. some of those are very good transferable skills. Yeah. Um, it doesn't get you immediately, you know, to the point where, where you may need to be um, as quick as you would like, but it, those transferable skills will help you start looking at processes and other things that you've learned in the past and transfer those skills. It will help you a lot. And a lot of that stuff helped me. I came from the trades. Uh, I, I, I took classes in HVAC that I thought would never help me because I never went on to use it. To get into healthcare, all of a sudden I understand the language. Yeah. Some of the technicians talking to me because I learned controls. I learned ducting. I learned a lot of things in that, that that did come. And I spent a good amount of time in construction so if I had a construction project, which you always do in, in healthcare, many times you have multiple projects, 
you know, that helped me. I knew it. I knew that world real well. Um, I also came from a world of working for door manufacturers. And I'm like, okay, I understand everything about doors and hardware. And like, and then the big push came for fire door inspections. I, I felt at home again. <laughs> so those transferable skills are critical as well. So the, um, let's talk in, in Taylor, I'll, get you in one sec, because I do want to hear your answer, especially from your perspective with your leadership in, in Texas and in the state, which is rather large. Um, Jack, though, relative to academia, because we see a lot of, you know, we're unfortunately seeing more directors, leadership in healthcare and hospitals transitioning over to academia, you know, because they're a, they're a valuable commodity. But for somebody coming the other way, now I you know, I had worked for a construction firm prior to healthcare, and we used to do projects at, at in colleges and some of these secondary schools. And I always found that it was very different between academia and hospitals, even just the pace. But from your perspective, coming from that world into the hospital world, what are some of the differences or what, what are some things that ac people who are directors in a, a university environment should be aware of as they transition? And what's that transition like for them? Well, first, I would say we need people from education because they do have some really good transferable skills. And it turns out healthcare pays more than education. <laughs> it just does. <laughs> so welcome to anybody listening to the call and uh, you know, think about maybe a, a, a transfer of, of your skills. It's a motivator. <laughs> it, it is. But, uh, you know, again, when you, you, you're managing people, likely if you're transferring over from from uh, uh, education, you're going to probably going to be managing people. So you gain that in the same mindset. You're going to be running for me facilities at the time. So I'm running equipment. We're, we still have to maintain the buildings. So a lot of that from a functional perspective of maintaining buildings, maintaining equipment, uh, HVAC, emergency power, um, it, it's still a lot of life safety equipment, although not quite the same focus. Um, all those things you are doing and you're learning and can transfer over. Now, when you get into healthcare, you're going to have to learn a lot about the different kind of requirements and yeah. the pace is much different. Um, they're 24 seven operations. You're usually responsible from everything from the street, the surrounding area, uh, throughout the hospital. I say every cubic inch of the air in the <laughs> building. So yeah, it's, it's a heavy responsibility. You'll be doing a lot more, but those skills um, will help you a great deal. <laughs> Taylor, to you, if you don't mind. Um, I think what question we were on. I know, I was going to say, so if, you I forgot, started... if you forgot the original question, it was way back when. What are you relative to the level of understanding and knowledge? What are you seeing? Uh, again, you've got your role at Children's, but you're also well involved on, you know, with your state of Texas. So from your perspective, what do you see out there? So just kind of thinking about, you know, Children's Health has a very young um, team relative to the industry. Um, I think our average age is like 40 um, of, of managers and directors. It is. And so I kind of use them as a guide. But when I look at our supervisors and what they know, it's they know they know the requirements. They know, you know, the basics when they walk down the hall, when they look at their their PNs, they know what's required. But when you get into those really, really tough code questions where you have to make an interpretation, um, that's when they come to me and we talk through it. So having somebody in your facility that is kind of the expert, not to say that I'm an expert, but somebody that has spent time in the code mm -hmm. and can talk those things through with you is really valuable. And it doesn't even have to be somebody in your organization. It can be, you know, ASHI or your local state chapter somebody you know in the industry that you can talk things through. I, I find it really helpful when I don't know something to call somebody up and say, here's how inter I'm interpreting this code. You know, do you agree? What do you think? What are y'all doing? Um, so to get back to your question, I think most facility managers, most supervisors, most directors, they know the basic requirements. They know what they're supposed to do. Um, it's just when you get into those really tough situations um, having somebody to call that you can talk those things through with. Um, but I will say I came into this industry with absolutely no knowledge at all. Um, I had been in a hospital once before when my brother was born. Um, and I, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. And my biggest resource was ASHI and my other 
the best thing I did was study for my CHFM because it kind of told me the entire realm of things that I needed to know because it covers such a broad variety of subjects. Um, when I first started studying it, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything, but just studying for it and digging into all those codes, digging into even the, the planning design and construction requirements, all the infection control. Um, those were things I wouldn't have known that I needed to know had I not looked at that exam. So that was extremely helpful. So if somebody's starting out, that's what I would suggest you do is even if you're not going to take the test for a couple of years, start studying for it because it's going to tell you what areas you need to focus on. This concludes episode one. Please return to the Healthcare Facilities Network in the near future to view episode two. And as always, thank you for watching.